So debt just remains to be a persistent issue in the Americans. The recession happened 16 years ago and threw millions out of work and destroyed their nest eggs. But then recovery, things looked much brighter. Consumers' debt levels had steadied and even slightly dipped from 08 to 2012. But then COVID hit, and then many people had been forced into insolvency or even foreclosure. They were unable to pay their debt obligations or even pay for their families. What are your thoughts on that, George? Indeed, I never. And so uh, Americans on the world, world today, you know, uh, face many challenges, including rising inequality, uh, unaffordable health care, changing climate, failing educational systems. Um, so to address these these challenges, we need significant resources. Um, to address this, these challenges, uh, we need significant resources. Um, every dollar that goes towards interest payments or credit card payments means less resources become available to a stronger more resilient future being built for ourselves. So how should our listeners view this? Well, that's why you listen to our podcast. One, two, three, four. Welcome to another episode of the Dapper Dollars podcast, where we answer your financial questions, but a bit with style. We're your hosts, George and Nirbon. So, George, what are we talking about today? Of course. Uh, so, this ep- episode, we will be discussing uh, good debt versus bad debt. Uh, there's certainty. Uh, there's certainly an, an argument that is to be made, like no debt is good. You see, um, but borrowing money, taking on debt is the only way. Actually, people can make per 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 purchases. For example, you want you want to get a big ticket item like a home, um, a car, even to get a degree. Um, while those kinds of loans are usually justifiable and provide value to the person taking on the debt, um, there's also another end to that spectrum that involves debt that is taken on carelessly. Um, so that's what we hope to discuss and have com- conversations around. So who do we have the pleasure to introduce as our guest today? Today, we have the pleasure to have Paul Adamson. Paul is a finance manager and a site controller for Amazon, and it is a co-president of one of the biggest affinity groups, the Black Employee Network, also known as Ben. Paul is a graduate of the Morehouse College with a degree in accounting. He is a former investment banker that worked on using debt effectively to purchase companies. He helped his family members eliminate over 100K in debt in a year and grew average credit score of his family members over 150 points. So welcome, Paul. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me. So to get this conversation started, I wanted to start with a fun icebreaker question. Uh, So let's just say if someone transferred over $10 million to your bank account, uh, what would you do with that money? Man, uh, first I'll check to see if it was real, right? Uh, (laughs) Pinch myself three times to see if I was dreaming or not. Uh, And then once I found out it was real... Uh, I definitely retire from corporate America and go full fledged into creating uh, pathways for generational wealth by opening up a financial literacy center um, here in Atlanta, also in my hometown of Boston. And with those proceeds, of course, I'll be able to uh, develop capital deployment programs to help entrepreneurs kind of start businesses, but also just providing free educational resources and, um, and, and money to support the community development development and um help people get better overall around how they manage money and put themselves in better financial situations. I'm glad you mentioned that if it's real or not, because you could also say, who is it from? Like it could be an ethical question too. True. 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 Uh, so yeah, that, that is actually a brilliant answer. And that's also good. It's a perfect um, segue to what, uh, you know, the main question should then be. So obviously one of your main passions, Paul, is, is promoting financial literacy uh, from a community level to amazing workshops I've seen you lead as well uh, for several employee resource groups within you know companies and stuff like that um, so in your definition um, can you speak to what good debt is versus bad debt sure so good debt versus bad debt a lot of people put it around like kind of the asset itself or the product that you're purchasing or even the rate um, but I'd like to keep it even simpler than that. Bad debt is simply anything that you purchase without a plan using someone else's money, right? Um, so if you're doing anything, especially if you're using someone else's money, which is basically what debt is, if you don't have a plan, then it's bad. If you do have a plan and you have an effective plan, you can always make 
good decisions, using other people's money to what we call as, as leverage to do the right thing, to create economic prosperity for yourself. Right. Man, that's good. I love that because there's so many people and I think it's just media in general where debt, it just seems like a, a it has a negative connotation to it, but it's how you said it. It's, it's in the, in the, at the end of the day, it's someone else's money. And if you have a plan on paying it off, then, then it's good debt. Right. So then Let's get to the meat of this. And I think that's why a lot of listeners are listening to this episode. How can somebody assess whether this debt is good versus bad? Got you, right? So I like to break it down in a couple of couple of facets just to make it digestible, right? So the first thing you're going to look at is the interest rate itself. No matter what you're buying, if you're looking at something, is this rate better than what the market can afford me? Uh, so when you think of it this way, if you have a loan that's at 3% and the current market rate is at 6%, that's good debt because you have debt that's lower than what it would cost someone else or yourself if you would go out to buy that same thing using debt right now, right? So that's the first qualifier. The second qualifier is utility, right? Are you buying assets or are you buying luxury items? Can this thing actually bring you what I like to call cash flow, right? Can you make money off of this item? For instance, are you taking out debt to go for education, which is going to hopefully get you a high paying job, which is going to bring you more money? Are you buying a rental property? Are you buying a business? Are you buying, you know, a home that's going to appreciate in value? That's going to allow you to then be able to take out cash from the equity that you accrue within that home. Right. That's the second qualifier. The third qualifier, of course, is will this improve your quality of life? And this is a piece that a lot of people don't talk about, right? So for instance, I like to look at quality of life from a couple of different facets, but as it pertains to us as Americans, right, a lot of us have been working from home, but now that's starting us to have us get back into the office and people are going back outside more. Some of you guys have been operating with one car households. What if you need another car to alleviate that pressure of sharing those burdens, right? How do you get there? Is that going to improve your quality of life, allow you to have more sleep, which I I put a high premium on sleep. I don't know about you guys, but if it's going to save me an hour in traffic, right, if I move 30 minutes closer to the city, will I be in two hours per day? When you add that up, that's eight hours per per week thereabouts, you know, given an hour and a half of traffic thereabouts sometimes, add that up across the course of the year, that might be almost like three, four weeks of pay, right? If you add in the sleep and the traffic factor. So that's a piece that I like to add into the analysis when I talk to different people that I try to help make decisions around what debt they should acquire and how they should go about acquiring it. So if you do those three things, you should uh, always be able to find a way to see, is this a good decision or is it not a good decision to acquire this this object with debt? Wow, that, that definitely makes sense. And I'll say uh, it definitely aligns with what we're trying to do here, you know, within this space where we are sort of correlating finance and lifestyle. So most of the choices you make uh, from a financial perspective, how does that flow into your lifestyle? So so what I take away here is like just that plan and execution. Like you plan about, okay, this is what I plan to do with this money and you go ahead and execute. So that alignment does just make sense. So cool. Uh, so uh, highlighting on the word, there's a word, very important word that I'm pretty sure our listeners would want to know, leverage. Um, can you share uh, some perspective on what the pros and cons are within that concept, basically? Yeah, so leverage, um, we just keep it simple, right? Leverage is just uh, a force that lifts you up, right? You're literally putting your hand on something to elevate you. Um, So in finance, that's like literally putting your hand on someone else's money to elevate you to another financial status so you can be able to execute a transaction, right? Um, And other other way that people say it commonly is using other people's money or the OPM acronym that everyone says or credit, right? So that's the same, same thing. And it's all analogous at the end of the day. Leverage just helps you get from point A to point B faster and just envisioning climbing on a wall. You're putting your hand up on a wall. You're using leverage and a force to lift yourself up to get over the wall, get over the hurdle. Um, and, and that's all it is. We, we make it more complex than what it is, but it's simply just using the tool of debt to get you to a higher economic status. I love that. And. I'm coming from a background of engineering and I love how you put that, break it down, what leverage is, right? For physical space. But then when I went into business school and then learning about finance, that debt is pretty much 
you can replace the word debt to leverage, but they're giving you the concepts and the really the implications of what debt can give provide for you in a good sense. And so I, I love how you broke that down in that and how you connect that bridge uh, together. And I think that's going to be a, such a valuable add to for all of the listeners. So then you mentioned about, you know, it can get us into good spaces, but also there's a lot of people who fall into bad debt. So like, you know, like breaking it down simply. And I like, I like how you always put things into simple terms. How would you avoid falling into bad debt? Like what are some um, commonalities that you've seen that people kind of, uh, steer towards and they should steer away from. So like I said, we talked about the good part of leverage, but too much of a good thing is a bad thing, right? Just keeping it simplistically. If you take on too much leverage, you'll topple over, right? So the example I like to use is uh, say if you had a flat tire and you're in need of help, right? You got to lift that car up. Essentially, you're using a, a jack to leverage the car up. If you leverage it too high, eventually you'll tip the car over and you'll be in a worse situation than where you are with that flat tire. Um, that's what people do sometimes when they get over their head or apply too much force or they use too much of that tool. They get over their heads and it ends up flipping over their situation. So instead of it being a positive outcome, it becomes a negative outcome. Um, essentially, what you need to do is understand what's your tolerance to take on debt. And that comes in with the planning aspect. Right. Um, so. A lot of times uh, the easiest concept for people to get this is with their debt to income ratio when they're looking at it, buying mortgages. Right. How much percentage of your income is going out to service debt or service your leverage versus how much you have to actually live upon for other different things. Right. Um, so you want to maintain a healthy ratio and they give you like different benchmarks. But of course, it's all personal to how your lifestyle is, of course. And what is tolerable for you. But there are standard things like, for instance, you shouldn't probably spend more than a third of your income on housing. Right. Whether that be for short term liabilities, forms of debt like rent or long term, like a mortgage, which was the leverage that you use to acquire the asset of your house. Right. So it's all about being smart and knowing what you can and cannot handle and manage. And if you don't know how to manage it. There's no shame because a lot of people don't. You just reach out to a professional to help you get some advice or like everyone does in this generation, tap into your favorite podcast like Dabba Dollars. <laughs> I appreciate that, that and plug. Thanks, thanks for that. And I, I just speak, speaking to that, obviously, one of the things that, that led us to, again, create this space was a lot of people don't have that, what I say, comf comfort to speak about money. And, you know, people get, they sink into death without like knowing when to reach, the, like, you know, raise their hands up and say, hey, look, I don't know what I'm doing. So how how can these concepts actually be applied? Because um, the reason why bad debt is so pre prevalent is just people don't have that knowledge, that understanding to know, okay, this is where I stop. This is where I draw in the line. This is where I'm actually over leveraging myself. Um, so from your experience, having like, you know, held like, you know, workshops and like trainings and seminars, like, what would you say are concepts people should start to apply to actually know better? Yeah, I think the easiest thing, too, is you make it relatable to other things that people relatively get. Right. So if you were sick, you would go to a doctor. Right. You wouldn't question the doctor. if They gave you advice. You want to ask your mom over the doctor's opinion. Right. So that's the first thing. So when we think about financial health, we have to be real and look at ourselves and say, are we financially healthy? And if most people, if you don't know. What do you do? You go seek out a professional. So you try to relate it through analogy to people. Um, but also like a lot of things when it comes to money is just like psychological factors that we face. It's all about how someone's mentality around money is and how do you change that is simply by asking for help with people that you feel comfortable with, comfortable with having this conversation. And if that that person doesn't have that information in and of themselves, there are plenty of different resources that you can get so you can feel comfortable that are available widely. For instance, Investopedia, or if you go through YouTube and you just type a, a search of a, a topic or, again, bringing it back to the podcast. Um, but even outside of that, I, it's just about um, even going to your banking institution and looking online. There's plenty of free resources that can get you comfortable to where you can ask. But essentially, all of these things are out here. It's just about people just changing their mindset. And you can only change your mindset when you become in a space where you feel comfortable and put that pride to the side. 
um, a lot of things around money is more of a mental health issue than it is an actual application of the processes because one plus one is always going to be two. 10% is always going to be 10%, no matter if it's up 10% of 100 or 10% of, of 100 million, right? The math will always be the same, but it's our relationship to those numbers, to that math, to that process, to that transaction, to the stock market, to the stock market effects. These are all emotional reactions that we have based on our mentality. So that's one thing I also want to bring up is uh, fin- you mentioned about financial health and I want to talk about credit scores. And so um, in the previous episode, we've talked about credit scores and how international people like some other countries don't really rely on credit scores. And so some people who are new to America uh, understand that this is a new concept. So, you know, how important is it? And also, like, what can it determine for your impact on your life? Yeah, so credit scores are super important because that's going to determine, at least in America, how much that debt is going to cost you or how cheap you can get that debt in comparison to someone else. So, for instance, I'll put it this to keep it simplistic, right? It's like having an A student versus having an F student. If you were a teacher and you had to have someone represent your class, right, and you're going to give them responsibility, who would you give that to? The student with the F or the student with the A, right? Um, So it's the same thing um, when we think about credit. So that's basically your grade in terms of how well did you manage the responsibilities or the assignments that you've been hold, you've been beholden to account for other people's money, borrow it and give it back. Um, but the, the good thing about credit outside of like the educational system is you can actually give someone your good grades. You can actually give someone your answers. Right. And that's called like creating authorized users on your on your different debt profiles if you have really great debt. And that's a tool that I use to change my family's life. Um, and with that, we were able to increase all of the different scores of my family members because I had an almost nearly perfect 800 credit, uh, 850 credit score. Um, and I was able to give all of those guys the gift of my credit history. They were able to refinance their debt, get better pricing, lower their monthly payments, be able to pay additional funds what they were paying at currently and be able to eliminate debt effectively because the debt formula is pretty simple. It's payment times interest times time. And if you do that across time, if you're able to reduce your interest rate, paying the same amount, you'll be able to reduce the principal at a more accelerated rate. So this is why that's super important. So your credit score will determine not only how much leverage you can take, also how at which price point that leverage is going to cost you. And it can be significant over time. Still going off of this topic, um, I wanted to bring some awareness to our listeners. Like if someone is in a pretty bad credit score, let's just say, how hard is it? You know, the strategy you gave us about the credit authorized user, if they didn't have someone like that, how hard is it to get back or is it easy? You know, what, what is the strategy behind that? Um, I like to say it's simplistic, but it's difficult, right? Um, and it takes time. So you have to be able to one, take a full holistic assessment of where you're at, get a financial checkup, understand what debt you owe, what income that you have across the board and map that out. And this is something I had to do because I was the first person in my family to really understand financial literacy at the, at the level that, that I had learned it at. Um, and I would say you can do certain, there's plenty of methods, right? That tell you how you can go through it. The easiest one to get out of debt is the snowball method, right? Which is you you rack and stack your, your outstanding liabilities, your debt. So if um, based on the amount and based on or either based on the total amount owed or based on the interest rate of that debt owned. Or you can do which is kind of more of the hybrid approach, which is you take the highest interest rate that you have with the lowest amount. So you can pay that off first and then you cascade the amount of payments that you would pay at that top level down until you eliminate everything. And the more that you pay off, the bigger amount of money that you have to pay it off. But again, Having debt in and of itself isn't bad to harken back to where we were at in the beginning of the conversation. So in our environment now with inflation, you had increased rates in terms of what debt is. So if you're getting money that's cheaper than what you can borrow it at, there's really no no rush to pay that debt off. So, again, if I can borrow money at three percent and I can lend money back out at six percent, I can make 3% difference, right? That's all the bank does. So essentially I can act like how the bank does. 
And I don't know about you, but I think banks are pretty smart because they've been around for over hundreds of years here in America. Right. So if they've been doing this successfully for hundreds of years, why should not do it once I'm in a position to do it? So that's the thing I would encourage people to do. Snowball, snowball method until you're at a point where your debt that's outstanding or other term for that is your weighted average cost of capital. But what I'll get into deep, if that is lower than what the current market is, then there's really no rush to pay that debt off. You can service it, service that through different means. Um, and be able to maintain and use your cash in a way that can bring you more money than you would save by paying off that debt and the interest that would accumulate from paying off that debt. And just a quick thing to our listeners, if you're starting off early in your financial journey, pay off that credit card debt. That's You don't want to get into that trap and kind of go through uh, kind of an uphill battle. Yep, because credit card debt is, is always higher, right? It's always at least 14 to 15%. And there's different strategies that you can even do with that. The better credit that you have, you can even balance transfer to 0% credit cards and eliminate 14% credit interest being built up over a certain time horizon. Um, but there's a lot of different things you can do. But ultimately, you just got to pick the method that you can stick to consistently. And that's always the best method, I would say, for each individual. The one you can actually execute towards is the best plan. I agree. I think, you know, uh, part of in the beginning part of your response to Anya Brown's questions, you mentioned key uh, being financial health. Like, so can you recommend to listeners who are really looking to be proactive about this? Are there, is there, are there any tools out there they can use to go have like some sort of financial health assessment? Because I know a lot of people are saying, what is debt to, to income rate ratio, but where is where they can go and um, check out? do research and actually and proactively um, assess themselves? Sure. So the first thing is looking at looking at your credit score. Um, so one of the easiest tools that's free and publicly available is like Credit Karma. You can go and check out your credit score. And you can actually see quickly what's on your report. The other thing is all of the credit bureaus actually offer free credit reports on an annual basis. And you can pull that information and see what's exactly attached to your name. Uh, the third place I will look at is if you have a 401k at your job, you can actually go into it. Most people use either like Fidelity or Wells Fargo. Fidelity is probably the more prevalent one. You go and look on there and they actually have, are you on path to retirement planners, right? And you can see that for free and see where you would be at based on your age and different things. Um, and don't get discouraged if you're not on path. It just means that this is what typically the algorithm would say is is ideal, but everyone goes about it the, any way that they can. But I'll say if you do those couple of quick things, you'll get to see exactly where you're at in real, real time. Um, and the last piece is then looking at your bank account and going through it. Three months, probably worth the transactions. You can go on any banking app, mobile banking app, and you can pull out your last banking statement and look through what you spent money on. Did you make wise decisions? and actually see what you spend your money on. And then from there, you'll have a holistic view of how financially healthy you are. And then the very next thing you do is ask for help, create a budget, create a plan, strategize, and change your money habits. I wanted to bring in a reference to an episode that we've done before. And it's talking about you know attending graduate school or just school in general. But you also mentioned in the beginning how you said a student loan can be um, a good debt. I think it could be also a controversial topic because it just depends on like if it can get you the right job and give you the payout for the loan that you took out, you know? So in your, I mean, I kind of shared my opinion on that, but um, how do you, how do you look at student loan debt? Uh, you know, the good debt versus bad debt type of conversation. How would you explain that to somebody? Or let's just say if your kid happened to ask you, um, should I take this loan out? for this particular degree? Yeah, it's, it's all about what, do you, what are you planning to do with your education, right? So it doesn't even have to always be a high entering field, right? So for instance, if you wanna become a social worker, cool, become a social worker. We know the average salary of a social worker isn't gonna be the same as a software engineer, um, but there are means to service that debt. Like I've said, it's all about the plan. So, um, you can use other people's money in terms of leverage to actually service your debt, like some of these repayment programs for like um, people who work for government agencies or people who work for nonprofits. Right. You can actually get your debt canceled. 
if you do these things. So it's all about your plan. So some people will say, oh, it's bad if you go to become a history major or art major. And I would say, no, if that's your passion, pursue it. But just you have to have a plan on how you plan on paying off that leverage that you took to afford that education. And if that is, I'm going to work for a nonprofit for 10 years and then my debt will be completely wiped away. Did you really lose? Is it really a bad decision? Not really. Someone may think so if they don't know your plan. But if you can show your plan like, hey, this is I'm a, I'm going to be working and doing what I love for 10 years and I'm not going to have to pay for this thing in 10 years. I'll just have to pay the minimum based on the income based repayment plan and I'll have work life balance. I'll have family life and I'll be actually doing what I love. And if I told you that right now, similar to like that $10 million question you asked me at the beginning of the podcast, a lot of people will say, hell yeah, sign me up for that tomorrow. But when you look at the decisions that they made coming out of college, a lot of people take jobs that they hate because they feel like they got to pay back that debt, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think you can see a lot of people, uh, they feel they are. Uh, I think that's what that's what causes the, the the mental burnout because a lot of people are stuck in jobs they, they felt they had to do and get because like hey look I have this death stare staring right at me and I need to get at it so in the end I like how you sort of advice like hey look pursue your passion um, but with a plan uh, do you understand what I mean so so that definitely makes sense yeah. and the thing I will add to that is even nonprofits make money. If you look up a form 990 and you look up some of your bigger nonprofits, the people who run these things make millions of dollars to do this. Right. Like look at United Way, for example. Right. They, Four million dollars as a CEO of running of the United Way. So like when people think about like art teachers and different things like they don't make no money. I'm like, that's because they didn't have a plan, because if they did, I know a guy who makes four million. Right. That is true. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so uh, I know you obviously, and you know, this is, this is also like more like going deeper into like the strategists, you know, to, to pay up debt. Um, would you say it's, it's advisable to like, I know I, I appreciate you kind of speaking on like, you know, again, using, doing like a balance transfer. A lot of people don't actually know um, that concept. Um, but do you feel like, you know, the current financial like environment, like like the ecosystem, do they give people that ability or that means? Or you feel like again, it's a lot of smoke screen covering up like uh, like that attitude towards like you know this is a strategy that will make you pay off debt faster. But do you feel like because again they make money off your money? Do you understand what I mean? Do you feel from your experience or from what you've seen through like the workshops you've held, um, is that something that that is happening as well? I, of course, the game is to make money, right? A bank makes money by lending out funds to someone for a fee, right? That's the interest rate. Um, but they are all in competition with each other, right? So as long as you play the competition against each other, you can always find a strategic advantage or something that works for you, right? So the system is designed to be won by those who know the rules. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't know the rules. So that's why they feel like the system is against them. But it's not. It's just you have to learn the rules of engagement. And once you learn them and like you guys probably know. Right. And I know you, you said gems on the podcast before. It's like your eyes will see things completely different once you know the rules. And it's up to us to, to give that information out to people so they can play the game effectively. And when you do it, you can win and you can win at a level that most people um, should be winning at, but just simply just don't know how to. But I guess the bigger question is, how do you win and how do you get to that those things? And I'm just going to keep it very simple, the same way we've been pointing it back to different things. Education, reach out to a professional, um, tap into your favorite podcast like Dapper of Dollars, right? Go on YouTube University, uh, reach out to a peer or colleague that you see or you hear about who, who works really well with money or even simpler than that, if you're working for a large corporation, you have a finance department, you have a treasury department, you have an accounting department, you have a payroll department, HR people. Go talk to those people and figure out how they manage it for a company. Because if it works for a multi-million, multi-billion dollar company, it should work for your company, which is a thousand dollar enterprise you. Right. So that's the way I, I, I look. I look at it, too. Right. Just keep it simple. Just go ask for help for the people who feel comfortable. I like that. And maybe there's listeners that value themselves differently, not just a thousand dollars, but 
But you're not compared to an Amazon or something. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant, right? We, we, we all are our own businesses. And when we start looking at it that way, if it works for the best of the best businesses, not saying that we aren't the best of the best people, but I know I'm not a trillion dollar company. I may be one day, but um, that that's the philosophy I, I look at it. We're going to take the best practices. We're going to replicate those things. And I already know that it works because I see it working. If it did work like an Enron situation, these people would be in jail right now. But obviously it's working. Yeah, I like that. Hey, um, I want to understand your take on this. When people are taking on short term debt, um, can like can that have negative impacts on their long term financial goal? Yes. Right. Um, here's how. If you have a short, short sighted vision without it tying back to the long term goals, you can always mess up things. Right. And I use again, I try to keep everything simple so everyone can get it. Uh, say your long term goal is to lose weight and you're working out and you're doing things. You have a strict meal plan. You have a strict workout schedule. Short term, you may have a celebration that comes up. Say it's a birthday party and you want to let loose and you have a couple of drinks. Then you have a couple of slices of cake. Then you have some fried food and different things. Then you have a couple more drinks because it's a birthday and that's what you do. All of those different calories and different things may spiral back those cravings that you have and that you were able to suppress by the discipline that you were able to put across for those two, three weeks, knowing that you had a six month weight loss plan. Right. And that may derail your long term vision. So bring that back to a financial um, standpoint. Right. You may have a short term event like Christmas and you want to buy gifts and you want to do all these different things. and You want to celebrate and you overextend yourself financially to satisfy everybody during Christmas. And that may affect your long term goals like becoming debt free, being able to buy a house in the next six months, being able to actually um, pay off your car loan or something like, of that nature. So it's all about making sure you have enough things to sustain you in the short term. But don't let the short term affect your long term just by making bad decisions that satisfy you temporarily, but won't sustain you in the long game. Well, that, that is cool. And that sort of just leads me to a question that has just been in the back of my mind. What are your perspective on the current buy now, pay later concept that's just been, I think it's just literally everywhere. Uh, so what are your thoughts on, on that? Do you think it's, it's something that's here to stay or... Yeah, I, w- I would love to hear what you think. It's leverage, baby. That's what it is, right? Um, a- essentially, it allows people to afford things in a manner which they can't afford it. But that's the trick. You probably can't afford it. That's why you have to break it up into those different payments, right? If you could afford it and or if you couldn't afford it and you had a plan to do it, why aren't you using different instruments that actually benefit you, right? So buy now, pay now, later is the same as a 0% interest credit card, right? In essence, so why don't you have this credit card where you can actually get some other different benefits from it? One, you're increasing your credit profile, your credit history. Two, there's probably some type of rewards points that you can get that will allow you to do other different things that will benefit you like sky miles or cash back promotions. Um, So like there's always, even the wrong things, if you have a plan, there's always a right way to do it. Um, So like I say, don't buy anything that you can't afford. But psychologically, if you feel like like kind of that third nugget that I gave you from your quality of life perspective, I wouldn't advise you to do it. But if you must do it for your quality of life, here's the best way to do that wrong thing. Right. So I would never advise a buy now, pay later. But if you did have to do it, the way that I just suggested would be the most optimal way of doing it. That's a good point. Yeah, because I think um, a lot of us can relate to this where um, there's times where you kind of get feel pressured, maybe either through friends that, you know, taking on a trip together, like the boys trip or whether it's, you know, going out on an expensive dinner just because, you know, hey, you're on, you're on a vacation. Let's just but it kind of goes back to like what we were saying earlier, like it goes to how you plan for these things. Maybe if you catch yourself doing a lot of these events, like um, more than usual, maybe, you know, next time you're about to go on that trip, plan a little more conservatively, add a little extra more to your buffer. So that way, if you're going to 
pay that extra amount, then still go about in with a comfortable mindset, not fret over it later in, uh, when you're looking through your bank account. Like I'll say this, right? Um, so one of the things I like to teach people and, and help people consult them through with my company is you can do the exact same thing you want to do without using the amount of money that you, you'd have to plan to do it. For instance, like I, I help people utilize credit cards effectively, right? And how do you leverage debt effectively? If you are going to, if you pay your phone bill off every month with cash and you're on time with that payment and you have the financial discipline to do that, why don't you use a credit card to pay that, that phone bill off? So if you have a $200 phone bill, right? And you get 200, you know, 200 points, like a dollar for dollar point situation, at the end of the year, you'll have 24,000 points. That points may actually be used to buy that plane ticket, right? So you're doing the same thing you was doing, paying your phone bill off every month, and you're disciplined on that. You should be able to do that. And now when it comes to that trip that you are, I can't afford the trip. Yes, you can, because the flight is free now, right? And if you had another bill that you pay, right, like maybe it might be an insurance bill and you pay your credit card. Now you use something that may give you hotel points. At the end of your year, same situation, you might look at it, you may have a free hotel. So now you have a free hotel, you have a free plane. Why can't you go on that trip with no no burdens and no stress? So it's even those small things of leveraging debt the right way, right? Or access to debt the right way that can alleviate the pressure that doesn't even cost you any money, but actually brings you in value. And you can use that money that you were then going to overextend yourself and get in a bad debt situation to help someone know about how you utilize credit and you can get a referral bonus. And now you have even more goodness to yourself, right? And you alleviated them of the pressure of not knowing. And now your circle just becomes better. And now you're able to make better decisions and hold each other accountable, right? Simple. And I'm a big advocate on paying those like large monthly items off of a credit card. I know I wish it was like rent or mortgage. You can put it on in your credit card, but they always charge you that extra little fee and it just kind of adds up. You don't want, like, at least I don't personally do that, but yeah. Only if it's worth it. Only if you get in like a super promo, like the introductory promos where they're like, we'll give you three free nights for this. And I'm like, well, 3% of this equals that. All right. So if the fee is less, it's just like everything else. If the free is less than the actual return that you're going to get, do it. But like the math will guide you. And that's the biggest thing that I would say. Like we talked a lot about the emotional part of the like the needs. Like if this is an emotional need, everything else is math. So I don't want to hear about wants. It's all about what you need emotionally to satisfy you. Everything else is a want and wants are determined by math. And if the math says yes, then we do it. If the math says no, then you don't do it. And it's simple as that. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, he just explained arbitrage. <laughs> that is so cool. I, I, I like it how uh, discipline uh, aligns with delayed gratification because a lot of people, because they just want that now and they tend to forget like, hey, if I, like you said, planning a trip is coming up in 12 months, why don't I start to put things in place? Like getting those points and those points I can use to pay it. Not one cent comes from, from, from my account and for my pocket so that's so cool i really do appreciate that you've just been dropping gems on, on us so i'm really glad you you came on this episode and so for us to kind of just go to something else like you no know, talking about that um so to sort of close this out uh, i think a lot of people want to kind of know what you like to do for fun um i know you're big on you know the giving back uh, through com community and stuff like that but what do you enjoy yourself man i i, I enjoy I enjoy life, man. I like to travel. I like to play sports. I like going to sports games. Uh, poker is one of my passions too, right? So uh, you probably won't hear that from a lot of finance guys, right? But like, I like the math. I like the risk. I like the psychology behind the game, right? So it allows me to, to practice risk theory in real time, right? Uh, in a way that's sociable. Um, but yeah, also I like to cook. So uh, if you really think I'm nice with the finance tips, you should see me in that kitchen because um, I'm, I'm A1 there. Um, but ultimately, um, I'm just a guy that's just a common guy from Roxbury, um, Roxbury, Massachusetts. For you guys that don't know, that's a part of Boston. 
that that just likes hanging around with his family and just helping people, man. That's so cool. I think I think we should definitely have a cook off because uh, cooking is, is my thing too as well. So. You don't want that type <laughs> of problems. <laughs> we definitely will. Hey, so thank you for being on our show um, and also really sharing your thoughts and the gems. Um, how can our listeners get connected with you? Sure. Um, so got to do the same as plug, Brandon. So 247K is a company I created. Uh, it's intentionally named uh, after the wealth gap that I, I noticed when I read this article called The Color of Money. So you can find me uh, at 247K Investments on all social media handles. I also have a website. You can sign up for a consultation. I'll be happy to help you create a financial strategy so you can do whatever you want to do, whether that's get out of debt, whether that's set yourself up for financial success, whether that's even having that conversation of, of what you should do next or how you should get started. Um, so I'm always here to help. Um, and of course, also catch me on LinkedIn too. Um, first name, last name, and I'm, I'm, I'm always here to, to give free gems or if, if you would like to become a client, always there to help you professionally as well. Hey, out of curiosity, how'd you come up with that name? Oh, so 247K is directly named after the wealth gap that I, I read about. So there was an article called The Color of Money, which was done by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, talking about Boston's neighborhoods and how the disparity between the wealth of people of the majority and then people of color. So the average net worth of a white family was 247,000. The average net worth of a family of color, whether it be Hispanic, non-black or black or Caribbean black was $8. So essentially zero, right? So the wealth gap between white families and families of black and brown descent was 247,000. So I don't get mad. I don't get bitter. I get better. So I said, I'm going to do something about this. So I created a company to directly target that by building community and education, dropping gems like, like we've done on this podcast. But ultimately, just keeping it simple, decoding and demystifying the financial services industry so people can make better decisions around money and better their family and close that wealth gap one family at a time. That's awesome. I love that. Me, me too. Me too. Me too. Demystifying that, 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 that is so cool. Yeah. Well, cool. Hey, uh, thanks for coming on again. We got to do some more collabs in the future. Finally, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. It would really help us out if you'd smash that like button and subscribe to our channel. And if you have other topics you want us to tackle, leave a comment below or reach out to us. So all links will be reaching out on the description box on how to connect with us. Again, thank you. Until next time. Bye. All. Yeah. Money.